welcome to the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast, where we hope to inspire you to embrace your God-given gifts, skills, and passions in order to lead with confidence. I'm your host, Esther Littlefield, a pastor's wife, business owner, mom, and writer. My co-host is Holly Kane, and together we chat about important issues that Christian women leaders face. In addition, we interview other women just like you who lead in various roles, from church to community to business. Through this podcast, we offer you encouragement, tools, and resources to help you on your leadership journey. We're so glad you're here with us. Hi, friend. I'm Esther Littlefield, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Holly Kane, and our guest, Sandy Flewelling. But today we're doing things a little bit differently, and I am going to be interviewing both Sandy and Holly about women's ministry. Welcome, ladies. Hi. (laughs) I'm so glad to have you both here with me. And I just want to mention, as we get started, if you are a regular listener, you might notice that Holly and I have both been (laughs) sick, and so our voices are not sounding totally great today. So I hope you'll forgive us for that. So um, I know that you are familiar with Holly's story if you have been a regular listener. And if not, you can go back to episode one uh, and hear her story and my story about how we both kind of got into leadership. And so today we're going to start off with hearing a little bit from Sandy Flelling, who is the women's pastor at our church. So Sandy, welcome to the show. And would you start by just telling us a little bit about your leadership journey? Thanks, Esther. Um, I, I kind of feel like I fell into leadership. Like I started on this slippery slope and all of a sudden I was a leader and I never intended to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. I'm an introvert and, and I have always been just a little bit on the shy side. Um, I'm the youngest in my family. So I was kind of set up to be a really good follower. Mm. And I think in a lot of ways I was and am. A good follower um, but I moved back to Maine in 2003 after uh, getting a degree in counseling at a seminary in Seattle and um, came back and was just trying to find my place back in my home state which I hadn't been in for a long time and started attending Open Door in I think 2005 and um, I went to the women's Bible studies at our church and enjoyed them very much. And uh, that, you know, that went on for a couple of years. And then there was one day when I just went to our pastor's wife, Lori, she was um, the one who was teaching at that time. And I asked what we were going to be doing next. And she said, uh, she named a book. And I said, Oh, well, that's really interesting. I happen to know the author of that book. Is there any way that I can help you? And something happened that I didn't expect. And that was that she said, yeah. And she turned the whole thing over to me, not just (laughs) reading a Bible study, but also doing like a one day conference that I thought we were doing together. And I found out later that I was doing it by myself. Um, But the thing was that even though I was terrified that day, were either of you there that day? I was not. I don't remember that. Okay. Even though I was terrified, um, I noticed something. And that was that my heart really came alive as I was leading Mm -hmm. that day. Um, And my role as a leader in a church kind of snowballed out of that. Okay. All right. So when do you think that you realized you were a leader? I went for a very long time insisting that I was not. Uh, that I was a teacher, Mm -hmm. that I was, you know, uh, a good Bible study leader. Um, But the evidence kind of started piling up in front of me that I was actually really good with groups. Um, We use materials from a lot of different really great authors, but I also found that every time I led a study, I was rewriting it because there was a question that just didn't feel like it was going to, Uh, invite people to really connect or there was a passage of scripture that I felt like oh this would be so appropriate here so I was constantly tweaking and constantly rewriting Um, and even at our retreats 
I, we started out using other people's material, and then one year the Holy Spirit just very strongly impressed on me that I could, I could actually do this. And because of the support of the team that I had at that time, um, I started writing my own retreat material and, um, and basically leading, leading all of the teaching parts of the retreat uh, myself. But I, I don't think that I really knew that I was a leader until I came to the place where I understood that a leader doesn't have to be everything. Mm. Because that was the part that was sticky for me. I am not gifted in all aspects of leadership. I just am not. And, and those areas were the places where I was feeling like I can't be a leader because I can't do these things. Instead of actually looking at the fact that I already was being a leader because I was doing these other things. Yeah. So not having to do everything was the big key for me to understand that I'm a leader. Mm. I love that. And that's so in line with what we're going to talk about today. So I think that's perfect. Were there other events or people that impacted your growth as a leader? Um, in 2012, I noticed that people at the church were starting to call me the women's pastor, which was a surprise to me. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so I went to our church leadership, our pastor and the elders and said, you know, people are calling me this. How do you feel about this? And they were just 100% in. And their kindness, their support of me uh, contributed to me being leader. But even more so in 2016, our pastor invited me to be on uh, the pastoral lead team for our church. And that's really where I think things began to snowball for me in understanding that I really was a leader. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. What about any mentors that you've had through the years? Is there anybody that's been a specific mentor for you just in life or specifically in leadership? Uh, I would say my pastor's wife really has been that for me in that she saw things in me that I didn't see in myself and basically said, this is what is darling, <laughs> whether you <laughs> believe it or not. And, yeah. um, she she very much mentored me into that. And also the first person who I did ministry with, which was a woman named Karen Reynolds, she also was a wonderful, supportive friend who she really was the person who showed me that I didn't have to be everything because she was all the other things. And <laughs> she did them very well. So we worked as a team. Mm, okay. I love that. So we're going to talk a little bit about women's ministry today. And uh, Sandy, you just alluded to the fact that you kind of took on this role as women's pastor sort of accidentally. <laughs> mm -hmm. So can you tell us now what your role entails as the women's pastor at our church? Um, ideally, it involves teaching and shepherding the women in our church. And uh, we lead two to three events per year. Those are the bigger events like ret a retreat. Um, and a couple of smaller evening events. Um, I'm also kind of the overseer of our women's Bible studies and small groups and prayer groups. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I help to set the vision for how our women's ministry is going to carry out the overall mission of our church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And I think also another part of it is that being on the, lead, the pastoral lead team for our church, I get to represent the women to the team. So I'm representing the church to the women and the women to the church. Mm. That's yeah, the, that's that, such an important role. Yeah, that's a place that I feel a lot of honor to be in that position. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So Holly, you have worked alongside of Sandy for several years prior to moving to Florida. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us about how you got involved with the women's ministry at the church and kind of how you ended up working alongside of Sandy? Yeah. So um, 
we talked a little bit before the episode and I had no idea how to answer this question, which is really <laughs> funny, but Esther was like, do you want me to answer it for you? Um, <laughs> so I had been involved in a bunch of other ministries prior to women's ministry. And um, I really enjoyed them, but I knew that they weren't my gifting. They weren't um, what my heart really like lit up about. And I had always, always, always had in the back of my mind, someday I want to work in women's ministry. Someday I want to do that. Um, you know, that's just really where my heart is. But I never really thought, okay, I'm just going to go do this now. And it's actually, the details are a little fuzzy, to be honest with you. I think I just, Sandy has a very magnetic personality and you just want to be around her and you just want to get all of her wisdom. So I may have just kind of latched onto Sandy and she was like, hey, you want to help me with this thing? And I was like, yes. <laughs> Do you remember anything more specific than that, Sandy? I feel like it was a little bit more official than that. Oh, okay. But, yeah. <laughs> You're probably right. Um, maybe it's the cold medicine that makes me not remember that specifically, mm -hmm. but I feel like I just fell into it. I think that you feel that way because we were kind of a natural fit together. I think that makes um, it. So that when, when I, when uh, my original partner in crime, Karen Reynolds, um, <laughs> when she moved on, I kind of had my eyes open for a little while for who could step into that role. And uh, you, you were, you were the person who I thought would do well. And I loved also that you were from a little bit younger generation than me. Mm. Uh, so to pull in someone who had a, a closer uh, finger on the pulse of what's going on right now felt really important yeah. and you're just awesome so. <laughs> <laughs> you. love it the same about you <laughs> thanks so sandy can you tell me a little bit about how you and holly worked together and like you said you had karen before holly so what were those two different kind of roles or positions what did they look like and and how did that uh, well, actually, let's just start with what it looks like. Okay. Um, I, I am gifted in the teaching, in the um, kind of setting the spiritual directing and, 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 or the spiritual direction and maybe um, vision casting, although I'm not 100% sure that I'm comfortable with that title. Anyway, <laughs> Holly is really good with making things happen. She's a great administrator, but she also has a heart for women. And that was like the perfect storm where she's able to make things happen and she's able to make things happen with heart. And uh, so together, she supported me so that I didn't have to do, you know, all of the logistical things. My mind could be completely freed up to, to take care of the, the teaching part of things. Um, and, and she made sure that, you know, that Facebook posts got out and that people felt welcome and people felt loved and cared for. Not that I don't welcome and love and care for people, yeah. <laughs> but, but she was kind of the face of, okay. of our ministry. Okay. Awesome. Holly, what else would you say that you did? And maybe we can use the, the annual retreat that our yeah. church puts on is really like the cornerstone event of our women's ministry. Yeah. And maybe you can use that as an example of how you and Sandy work together on that type of event. Yeah. So thankfully, when I got gifted the retreat, um, and I definitely look at it that way, um, it was already a well-running machine. Um, Karen and, and, and whoever else, you know, got that working. I think Lori was part of that too. And I'm sure there were a bunch of other people, but it really, it was already rolling. I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. I just had to take what was already, um, chugging along very well and just keep the momentum. So that really was huge. I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. So, um, when I stepped into that role and when I started doing it, I, I was a little bit overwhelmed at first because I thought, oh my gosh, I need to make sure every single detail is perfect. 
And it was not very long after that that I realized, no, my job is to mentor the team that I'm working with. So we had um, a team leader over like food, someone who does registration and rooming, someone who does small groups, a prayer minister team, um, someone who does worship. So it was my job to really look at those people as my group of leaders and pour into them, make sure that they had everything that they needed and to kind of portray to them the feeling that we wanted their specific um, section to portray to our guests. Um, so like the food, we want the food to be welcoming to everyone. That means if you have a dietary issue, we want those people taken care of. We want there to be plenty of food. We want it to be healthy and not, um, you know, super uh, unhealthy. <laughs> um, you know, we want it to be warm and inviting. So those sorts of things. Um, the people who do the decorations and the gift bags, we want you to portray to our guests that, um, they're cared for in every way that we try to think of everything. So it was my job, I feel like, to really instill in those other leaders what we were looking for. And honestly, they ran with it. Each time we've done this, those specific leaders to those different categories have, have run with it and have done it beautifully. And so when I look back and I think, oh my gosh, you thought you had to do it all, it kind of makes me laugh because there's no way one person can do it all. Um, and even if I did, there's no way I would have done it as well and with as much love because I would be so overwhelmed. So mm -hmm. as the person that kind of does the things, it's super important when you're putting on a big event like this to have those leaders that are in charge of a certain area and that have their own team. Mm -hmm. And it was really important for me to instill in those people that um, it was their job to lead their team. So, you know, when we had a women's ministry meeting, it specifically for the retreat, it, it often wasn't those people in the outer teams, it often was just the, those leaders of those individual teams. And then, you know, not that those people weren't welcome, they certainly were, and sometimes they came, but it was more for us to talk to those leaders of each of those areas. Did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get you talking did. about it and then I forget <laughs> yeah, where I'm going because I love it so much. Sorry. And I think, I think, Holly, that you made such a good point when you said that you want to bring uh, the vision of what we want to do to that group of leaders. Yeah. Um, because I think it's important when you're putting on an event to have one focus, yeah. one direction that you want to go, that you want everybody to be able to walk away from that event knowing this is what I went for and this is what I got. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so having everybody on the entire team on board with that one focus is critically important to mm -hmm. people being able to walk away knowing this need that they said they were going to meet, they actually met. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think and that's what not, makes a powerful event. Yeah. And there's not one team that is not part of this, right? Like, right. Say like, oh, well, you don't really need to bring the person who does the food in on it. Well, absolutely, that's not true because she's creating an atmosphere of caringness, caringness, care, and <laughs> love for the people who are attending. She's making them feel comforted. She's, you know, nourishing their bodies while their soul is getting nourished as well. Like, there's not one team that's not important to that mission. Right. Um, Absolutely. And we have a lot of um, people who are working behind the scenes. We have a whole prayer team that prays the entire year long. And while at the event, people may not know who those people are, they are an integral part of everything that's going on. They're ushering, you know, every single one of those women that are attending to the throne room of God on a weekly basis all year long. Like, that's crazy to me to think about. And it's really important that every team leader knows just 
how important they are to that single vision. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I think one of the just amazing things that we're talking about today is, you know, Sandy, you tar- started off by saying that you didn't feel like you could be a leader because you couldn't do everything. And now we've talked about the fact that, you know, you had Karen and then you had, you had Holly coming in. And now we're talking about this whole team. And so I think that a lot of women in church leadership specifically tend to have that feeling of needing to be able to do it all <laughs> and mm. have all the gifts and, and manage all the things. So Sandy, can you just share some of the advantages that you have found in having Holly alongside of you and then also having a larger team? What are some of the advantages that have been uh, beneficial for the women's ministry of our church with that? I think- the biggest advantage is that we all get to do the thing we love. Mm. And when we're working in the thing we love, then we can put together something that's really excellent because you don't do the thing you love poorly. Yeah. Um, So Holly taking on all of the logistical aspects of the retreat freed me up to just sit down with the Lord and have time to really work through what our teaching was going to be, um, what the, what the focus is. She just freed me up to do the part of the retreat that I really love to do, which is putting together the program. Mm -hmm. And, um, if I had to think about all of those other things, I would have been distracted from the one thing that I love. So for all of us, we get to work in the place we love. The person who's in the kitchen is working in the place that she loves. And mm-hmm. when there is passion, um, there's always going to be good results. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about you, Holly? What do you see as some of the advantages? So I think the reason that I really love how we have things sort of set up is we almost have a natural this is going to sound weird, but a natural succession, if you will. Um, Sandy poured into Karen and then Karen poured into those other leaders. And then Sandy poured into me and then I poured into those other leaders who are able to pour into their team. And then everyone who's working is able to pour into our guests. And it's just kind of this trickle effect down. And not to say that Sandy isn't pouring specifically one-on-one into other people because she most certainly is. But um, I feel super privileged because I feel like I was just like drinking from a fire hose every time that she um, would like give me the wisdom that she had gotten from God. And, um, you know, you get to Sandy specifically pulled out things in me and, and pointed out things in me that I didn't know were there. And, Um, it sounded like she had the same experience with Lori. Yes. And I have been able to have the same experience saying those things about other people, because after I heard what it sounded like, then I could definitely see the things in other people and say, listen, girl, you have got this. I can already see it in you. You can't see it, but I can see it. Mm -hmm. And it's when we call gifts out in other people that they feel And we feel able to step into those roles and God just kind of goes, yep, they are absolutely right. I've been forming that in you. I created that in you when you were born and I gave you those gifts and, you know, I want you to use them for me. And I just feel like the way that that team was set up and the way that we had things going was just a perfect story for that kind of mentorship, mentoring each other and loving each other and calling out gifts in each other. And, and I love our team. When we sat down together, we were never short on compliments for each other. And I don't mean it in like a surface way. I have heard some really um, poignant messages from God from the women around me. They have mm-hmm. told me things that for some reason I didn't know (laughs) about myself, (laughs) about my relationship with God, about, you know, about things that I needed to remember about him. And it, it it wasn't just from Sandy, a majority of it was, but, but so much of it came from the women that surrounded me doing their passion as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that really what you guys just described is, is this, 
natural mentorship that has happened and leadership development that has happened within the women's ministry. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, it's been so successful is that no one person has held the reins all to themselves. Right. Yeah. And, the and no one person has done all the pouring either. The pouring has gone both ways. Holly, you've poured into me. Karen poured into me. Yeah. The members of my team pour into me. Just they're doing their jobs well, ministers to me. Mm -hmm. um, and like I've said before, it frees me up to do the part that I really love. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that is awesome. And it's really amazing when everything is working on all and all <laughs> cylinders are, are functioning well, right? But I'm sure there's been some challenges too. So <laughs> can you share any challenges that may come with when you are working with a team, when you're working with two different kind of leaders um, that both have amazing skill sets? So let's start with Sandy. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yes. I, I am very comfortable working last minute. Um, some people call that procrastination. Um, but I actually have learned that that's part of my creative process, that I kind of think on things and chew on them and stew on them and, and do a lot of the work in my head before I actually do any work on paper. And I know that for other people who are depending on me getting things done, that that can be a little bit scary, uh, can make people nervous because it looks like we might not make it. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow we always have, we except, always except um, last year that was really put to the test when I was in a family situation where I had a brother who had cancer and um, my closest brother. So it was a really difficult time for me. And somehow I felt like God still wanted me to do our ladies retreat, even though it was right during the time when he was in his most intense uh, parts of his journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to, you know, a couple of weeks, we got to a couple of weeks before the retreat and my brother actually died. So I had to hand over a lot of what I normally do to Holly. And I think I scared the poor girl <laughs> after that. She was already planning to do some of the speaking that year, but she was not planning to do all of the speaking that year. So, um, you know, that was, that, that's a little bit of a challenging place where one person has one very critical role when they fall out of the picture. Um, unless you have a team that is confident, things can start to fall apart. Things yeah. do not fall apart for no. them because both um, Holly and Lori, our pastor's wife, stepped in and really picked up the ball and did it beautifully. But, you know, that's part of the issue with working with a team. When one member falls, other people have to be ready to to step in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Holly, what yeah. about you? Any thoughts on challenges that may come when you're working with a team or with a, another leader? So I think that, um, I'll actually say two perhaps. Um, I think that sort of the thing that Sandy talked about where she, um, said that she is more comfortable sort of doing things later that didn't necessarily bother me because I, I, I am also to some extent that way. Um, but I think in general, just when you work with someone that works so entirely different than you, it can be very, um, sort of, it can throw you for a loop. Um, because oftentimes we think our way is the best way because in our brain, it makes perfect sense. Right. Um, but when someone else works totally different than you, it can be difficult to, and especially if you are in a leadership position over that person, let's say, or you're working with them, it's hard to step back and go, okay, I need to trust them that they're going to get it done. And I need to trust them that they understand the vision. Um, and so I think that it's really good to continually communicate what that vision is. And I feel like we did that every single time we had a meeting or we talked about it. 
we talked about the vision. We talked about what we wanted people to get out of um, the retreat specifically. And um, sometimes it was a whole lot of trusting, trusting that this is God's event. And even though this person might be doing something totally different than the way I would do it, I'm going to trust him that even if it turns out totally different than I would do it, that it's his event and he's going to use whatever that is to touch someone Mm -hmm. or to minister to someone in some way. And so it's a very like hands on, hands off, hands on, hands off. Like, (laughs) and you're constantly in that tension of I'm, I'm trusting you to, you know, fulfill this need that we have at this event. And I know that you can do it. Um, and then, and then just trusting from there, sometimes we have to do a little course correction, but I don't know that we've ever had to do like major course correction. Um, and I think even if we didn't do that tiny course correction, nothing would have fallen to pieces. It's it's just small details. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one. And then I think the other is just communication. I think that that's always a challenge. Um, sometimes people hear things differently than you say them. And and this might actually go right along well with the first thing I said, but making sure that people hear exactly what um, they're supposed to be executing, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and really saying, okay, this is how it fits in with the bigger vision. This is how you are um, impacting those people that are attending. You know, this is how your your piece fits and really conveying what we want people to get out of it um, to the best of our ability. And then, you know, sometimes people still don't hear it how you want them to hear it. Um, And that goes back to the trusting again. Um, As far as kind of what Sandy talked about, I, I have, I had been wanting to speak for quite a long time. I had been sitting in our women's retreat going, someday I want to do that. Someday I want to do that. And, and I, and I could kind of see this coming down the pike because I knew what Sandy was going through. And, and, you know, and I very early on said, I'll do whatever you need. Just tell me what you need, you know? And, and for me, and what I encourage every person who is in sort of these, leadership type roles is to be willing to jump even when you're scared out of your mind. Like I was scared out of my mind, but I knew for a fact, A, that Sandy wasn't going to let me fail, B, that God wasn't going to let me fail, and that C, I knew I wanted to do it. I knew that I had a passion for it, but I didn't know how. And, you know, I just kind of gave it back over to God and I, you know, laid it out in front of Sandy and said, okay, this is what we have to do. Here's what I'm thinking. Like, tell me if I'm even close to right, you know? And I think that as a leader, you have to be willing to do that sometimes because it shows um, a really deep trust in your relationship with God when you're able to just jump freely into his arms and let it, and, and allow him to handle every detail of it. Um, and I think it's important for women in our ministry to see that um so yeah I just wanted to say that about what she said so (laughs) yeah and I think what was amazing to me about how all of that happened is that you know this wouldn't that wouldn't have happened you being able to step up and Lori stepping up wouldn't have happened if Sandy had been trying to run the retreat all on her own all these years, you know? So it was several years of developing and mentoring and working with a team Mm -hmm. to be in a place where when this, when this family tragedy took place and unexpected changes that, you know, there were people ready and that, you know, yes, it took you, Holly, having a step of faith to do it, but you also had been prepared prior because Sandy had poured into you to do that. And two, I had been working with with another, I had been working with our friend Taylor very closely and I was able to pass along some of the logistics stuff to her and say, I can't, I can't do this all. Like I just can't. And she just stepped right in and picked right up where, where she had been helping me before she kind of knew. And oftentimes I fulfill the sort of MC role and I greet people and I'm kind of like, 
the mouthpiece. <laughs> I talk and, you know, I try to make it fun and, and whatnot. And I said, I can't do that. And so I had to just throw it squarely on Taylor's shoulders and she ran with it and did it beautifully. So I think that natural pouring in and mentoring each other on the team really emboldens and encourages people to step into things that either need to be done or are their gifting or, you know, they can step up into those things with confidence and um, feeling like they're on a team that's supportive and, you know, that they can jump in and meet any of the challenges that we have. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked a lot about specifically how we've run things at, at our church and how our women's ministry has run, but let's talk a little, a little bit more generally. And I know that both of you are very passionate about reaching women, about encouraging women, about drawing women closer to Christ. So I'm going to start with you, Sandy. I'd love to hear what you believe women really are looking for and needing in churches from their women's ministry. Um, or, or just in general, what they're needing in churches. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with needing more instead of looking for. Okay. Uh, because yeah. I really believe that what we most need, what everybody most needs, is uh, time and opportunity to be intentionally face-to-face with God. Like to put ourselves in a place, an, an undistracted place, of being in the presence of the Lord, because that's the place where healing happens. That's the place where growth happens and life happens. That is the thing that we need the most, but people don't necessarily know that that's what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, so I like to sneak it in, in three, I, I think in three different categories, which is connection, um, connection with each other, connection with people from different generations, connection with people f- who are very much like us. Um, so connection is the first thing. And the second thing is depth, that, that women are really looking for depth in their relationship with God. They're not looking for Christianity light. They, if they're going to be serious about this, if they're going to, if they're going to, uh, say that they're all in, they actually want to be all in, in ways that are not shallow. Um, So connection and depth. And I think the last thing that people are looking for is purpose, a place to fit in, a place to know who they are in this big picture. That's the kingdom of God. Um, Mm. When I started doing this, I felt like I was, I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer. So I kind of bridged the gap between the baby boomers and the millennials. And we definitely had that in our church. We had, uh, you know, a strong group and I don't at all want to diss what was already happening in our church because beautiful things were happening. They did beautiful events, but they did it in a very baby boomerish way, um, a more traditional way. And then we also had a lot of millennials up and coming in our church. And I feel like my job was to kind of, to kind of bridge the gap between those and help the baby boomers to maybe release a little bit, help the millennials to come in and feel like you belong with these baby boomers. We all belong together. Um, Mm -hmm, Definitely. I feel like, you know, boomers, this is a total generation. Boomers are the doing generation. Generalization. Did I say gen? I don't know what I just said, but anyway. (laughs) <laughs> you said generation, but I think you meant general. I meant generalization, total <laughs> generalization. Boomers are the doing people. Uh, millennials are the being people. Mm. And we need both. We need both of those things to come yeah. together. So mm. I don't know why I went off on that tangent. I just... No, I love it. No, because I actually thought about the fact that I didn't have any questions about bridging generational gaps. And so you just answered that question without even me yeah. asking. So perfect. <laughs> Gold star. Um, so Holly, what about you? What do you think that women are looking for and what they're needing in churches? Um, so I, I definitely agree with Sandy. Um, for me, I think that women are looking for, I totally agree with her on the depth. Um, I'm looking for other women who are a little bit ahead of me 
And I feel like, I feel like when I am sort of with people who are in my generation, they are looking for the same thing. I'm looking for women who are ahead of me, who have a deep faith and, um, who know a thing or two about the Bible and who are willing to pour that wisdom, that life wisdom and the, you know, everything that they've gleaned from a relationship with Jesus over the years and to pour those things into me. I'm looking for people who are real and authentic and who don't just say the cliches, but have sort of lived life figuring out how to do them. And I think like specifically, you know, let, let go and just give it all to God. Well, that is true. That, that is truth. But when you say it flippantly and you say it without any sort of real life experience behind it, it comes off trite and uncaring. And I don't ever want anyone to come into a women's ministry and feel that way. I want them to see that people have actually had to figure out how to let go of a child, a sibling, you know, a husband or a wife, um, a situation, you know, they've had to let go of something that feels like it's their entire life and God has still got it. Um, I want someone who's, who's got some, some wrinkles on her face, someone who's been through some stuff, someone who's, who's, come out the other side and is still beautiful and is not jaded and has a gorgeous heart. And I just want that because I, as Sandy was talking about that generational mix, you know, those people have been through things that I, I could never imagine. And sometimes my, you know, quote unquote, little hardship feels like really a, a huge thing to me. And when you share your experience, it helps me get through mine. Um, and I think that through doing that, we just share the love that God has poured into us, into other people. And we show other people that he's real. And we show other people that he's going to show up for you. And we show other people that he's not in it um, to see you necessarily become a robot that does everything that he wants. He's in it for a relationship with you and he wants you to display his glory to other people. Like that, that's a real thing. And that's a real thing that can get you through hard life stuff. And that's what I want in my women's ministry. And I think that's what other women need. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So can you share a couple examples of maybe ways that women's ministry can be part of meeting these needs. And I'll start with you, Sandy. Uh, any examples of how, how we've done it at our church or other churches that you've seen have done it well in meeting these needs? Mm -hmm. I think that the first place that those needs are met are in small groups. Mm. Um, that those are the key. Those are the places where we make space for everybody to get their, their connection need, their depth need, their purpose need met in a way that speaks specifically to them. So, you know, we might have, uh, we for quite a while have had a group of younger women who've met together. And we also have a group of the older ladies. We have a group of ladies who their heart is for prayer. So we we have a prayer group going. So in those small, smaller groups, those are the places where, where um, those needs are met on a very, very specific basis. And then at our larger events, um, those are the places where we all come together, where we're all equals before Jesus, where we all have uh, one purpose. We're meeting him personally, but we're also meeting him as the body of Christ mm. um, and allowing him to define us, allowing him to unite us. Those things happen in the bigger groups. Um, that's kind of how we have done it. Just basically small groups and big groups. Yeah. If yeah. you want to yeah. just really simplify it. Yep. And I think one thing you mentioned earlier is that we basically have three to four events per year max. Max. And yeah. We and I think that's something that we've done well is that we've we've kind of trimmed down the number of things we've done so that we can focus and do those things well. Mm. Right. 
And uh, instead of trying to do something every single month or whatever, and, and like you said, letting the small groups be the, the foundational place where that connection and the, the depth and the purpose takes place. Right. And yeah. those small groups are the place where, you know, if somebody wants to have a group that does quilting, fabulous, get together and have a group that does quilting. I am not going to be in that group because I don't really care for quilting. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's that there's not, if, are you, I'm, I'm just going to back up a little bit here. Our women's ministry, when I first came into it, we had a, we had a collection of teacups that belonged to the women's ministry that were on display on our, in our church. And I personally looked at those teacups and saw, I saw um, something that was old, something that had no connection to me. Um, mm -hmm something that I felt like defined us as women in a way that was not good to our church. Um, and so my heart was to just like, let's get rid of the teacup collection. Let's show that we are serious. But there were women in our church who that teacup collection actually represented something very special and very unique. And I heard a lot of feelings when I got rid of the teacup collection. So I mm -hmm. think it's really important to make a place for people to be able to, um, for people to be able to be who they are mm -hmm. and to love what they love and uh, to come together with each other, to come together with the Lord in the place where they are comfortable. Mm. Yeah. And to create those common connections based on, like you said, common interest. Right. And and then the deeper connection comes, the deeper uh, connection with God comes after that initial kind of surface connection. Right. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. So Holly, I don't want to skip over you. Do you have any other examples of things that we can do to, to meet those needs? No, I think you guys said it very well. But one thing mm -hmm. that I think as a consumer of women's ministry is during our retreats, we used to do small groups and sometimes they were very, um, you know, very interest, very interest based. So if, if we were kind of all friends, we were in a group and then sometimes they were very, um, very diverse. And for me, I found some very deep connections with some women that I don't know that I would have met without sort of being forced, not forced, but if I, if that opportunity hadn't been given to me to be in a group with a bunch of diverse women and most mostly the diversity I'm talking about is age ranges. We had lots of different age ranges and I met some really amazing women who really spoke into my life and, um, you know, really met some, some needs that I had. And so when we go from those small groups to those big groups, it, it just, I just love how beautiful it is and how God gives us opportunities to meet people that have something specific to share with us and meet those specific needs. So I don't really have anything new to say other than I really enjoy that part of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the advantages of having some events that are cross-generational, yes. uh, that that's where you're going to make those connections with people that you might not normally yeah. uh, spend time with. So yeah. I like that okay. we do both. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's talk for a minute because I think there are some listeners who may be in a place where their church maybe doesn't have an amazing women's ministry like we're talking about. And maybe it's a smaller church or maybe they're, they're newer and they're looking for a way to get involved or to start something. So I'd love to hear, Sandy, what are your thoughts on how somebody could maybe approach that uh, a place where they want to start or, or strengthen a, a ministry that is already in, in place. Mm -hmm. Well, first I want to emphasize that we actually are a small church. Yeah, that's true. Um, our yeah. church is not a large church, so we don't want to give the impression that no. we have this huge staff that are making all this happen. No, we fit firmly in the category of a small church. Um, mm -hmm. So it can happen in small churches. Yeah. Um, the first thing I think is to just start praying for God to raise up the people who can partner with you in women's ministry. 
Um, but the second thing is don't be afraid to cooperate with other churches. Um, other area churches who are Bible believing will have resources that you might not have, and you might have resources that they don't have. So uh, cooperation with other churches is really key and really helpful in mm. meeting the needs that you can't necessarily meet in your church. Mm-hmm. The second thing that I would say is don't try to do everything. Um, actually identify the, need, identify the needs that are actually in your church. Um, and work there and do the most important things. Do yeah. the things that directly lead women into having an encounter with the living God. Because mm-hmm. that's the place where when people start thriving in their relationship with God, then they will naturally start wondering, what is my purpose and how can I contribute to the kingdom of God? Mm-hmm. So start with the most important thing. Yeah. 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 Holly, any thoughts on that? Um, of course, I totally agree <laughs> with whatever Sandy says most of the time. <laughs> um, most specifically that answer. But um, I think I would encourage you to look around. Look around and see what's already happening and pray for what's already happening and speak life over what's already happening. Yeah, It's very easy to look at another ministry and go, that's what I want and we don't have it and get upset and bitter and frustrated. It's super easy to do that. So you have to start from a place where you're thankful for what is already going on where you are. You know, I have to say that with a bit of a caveat, you know, sometimes there are super unhealthy things that are happening, but if you have something that's just small and sort of, um, but it's healthy, small, but healthy, like let's, let's celebrate that and let's work there first. Um, and let's speak life over the people that are already doing stuff and let's see how we can support the people that are already working. Um, and then I agree with Sandy, pray, pray for the people that need to step up or the people that should be fulfilling certain roles, pray that God will impress upon their hearts and work in their life so that they feel that they can do that. Um, and I think the last thing is if you have a group of women that you are, you know, four or five women, handful of women in your church that you're close with, pour into them pour into those people and speak life to them and speak positively about the ministry. There's nothing more mobilizing than when you have someone who's positive and who wants the best for the ministry and is willing to speak well of it and to encourage people in it and to, you know, be a raving fan of that ministry and your passion and your um, love will be contagious. And the people that that's going to rub off on are the people in your very close circle. Um, So pour into them and tell them what's going right. Give compliments about other people when they're around or when they're not around. Um, The best thing that you can do is to really encourage what's already going on rather than um, stifle or get frustrated or think that things should be handled differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Support, 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 support. Right. Okay. So we're getting close to wrapping up. So Sandy, I want to come back to you and ask you a couple questions. One is if you could share advice with a younger leader who maybe is just starting out with Um, in her ministry or in her career, what would you share with her? I think the most important thing is to focus on what you love. Um, Work in the places where you actually, you get life back from doing them. You get energy back when you do them. Um, If God wants to grow something in your church that is not in your skill set, you have an opportunity in front of you to trust that God will raise up the person who does have that skill set instead of you having to be that person. If it's not happening, just trust God for his timing. Mm -hmm. If you can't fill that need. Yeah. Yeah. Do what you love. Do what you love. Do what you love. Yeah. And 
you mentioned at the beginning that you're introverted and Mm -hmm. that you didn't necessarily feel like a leader for a long time. So what would you say to someone who has that same feeling that maybe feels like maybe they're not cut out to be a leader because of their personality or because of how they're naturally wired? Mm -hmm. I would say um, don't take it at face value that you will always be exactly who you are. (laughs) <laughs> Does that make any sense? I love that. Um, yeah. <laughs> trust in the power of the Lord to to do the things that you can't do. Mm-hmm. You know, I still get terrified before I step onto a stage to speak, even though I've done it many, many, many times. I am still afraid. But when I, you know, I have um, the advantage of having seen how the Holy Spirit works. And knowing that I don't have to trust in myself to be able to do this job. I have to trust in the fact that he is going to come and he's going to empower me to do the things that are not in my skill set. If, if he has asked me to do them, he will give me the power to do them. Mm. And, um, you know, again, I keep, I keep pounding this nail, but if you, even if you're uncomfortable with it, if it gives you a thrill, if you actually love it, it might be a clue to you that you can do more than you think you do, even if it terrifies you. Yeah. Because I love speaking and I'm terrified of speaking. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Holly, do you have anything else to add about, you know, advice to a younger leader um, starting out in ministry or career? I don't think you've ever actually answered that question. So. Okay. I think I have. <laughs> um, oh gosh. Honestly, the biggest thing that has been helpful to me is having an amazing mentor. I mean, honestly, I don't think I would be where I am today without Sandy pouring into me. And um, I just love her so much and I'm not going to be like super mushy and crazy right now, but I could make me cry. (laughs) I know (laughs) I could easily just totally spend the next half an hour talking about how amazing she is, but separate episode. Yeah. Separate episode. (laughs) (laughs) Um, finding that person who you admire, who for lack or lack of a better way of saying it, you want to be just like when you grow up, um, and getting to have like a real live relationship with that person is invaluable. Um, Sandy has been very fabulous to show me parts of her heart that um, that maybe she doesn't open up to everyone. But more than that, she showed me parts of God's heart that she's mined for herself. And that takes a lot of work to really intentionally go after God every single day. And it is, it's obviously life changing, but when you can sit down and solidly inside your heart go, I know exactly who God is because A, B, C, and D, I've, I found that he is A. I know that he is B because of how he did this in my life. And, and I know I know this and I, and I know this and, and she's just laid it all out for me. And I've been able to pick some of that stuff up for myself and go, yeah, I know those things about God too. And it just kind of binds our hearts together. And, you know, that's, that's biblical friendship, but it's also as a leader and as someone who's, who wants to grow towards leadership, it's invaluable. It is invaluable when you have that person who is willing to speak into your life and speak into your heart. And, um, yeah, I don't know how else better to say it, like find that mentor because they are hugely invaluable to your journey as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say to other leaders, find the people who are hungry, find the people who want to connect, find the people who you feel connected to, to pour into mentorship doesn't have to be this, you know, you know, thing where you awkwardly put two people together who would not naturally be together. (laughs) Um, 
the best mentorship happens when there is a natural connection. And yeah. Holly and I had that, you know, yeah. I feel it in a lot of ways, like she's the little sister that I never had. She's a sister <laughs> from a different mother. Um, yeah. So, you know, we had a rapport going in yeah. and uh, there's a lot about our personalities that are similar. Yeah. yeah. We're both fours. <laughs> and oh, I'm, a, I'm a big old four. <laughs> I think, I think too, that it's, it's, I, I, just to piggyback a little bit on what Sandy's saying, mentorship is amazing, but when it can happen in the confines of friendship, it's even better because all that stuff that I talked about that, that Sandy was able to relate to me was interspersed between like snort laughing about something stupid, <laughs> right? Like, it's not, it wasn't like we sat down and I said, okay, give me your wisdom. Yeah. And I just kind of opened my hands and I took it. Like, that's not, it wasn't that awkward. It was interspersed with talking about clothes or, you know, crazy hair days or, you know, <laughs> bad breath or, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's interspersed with all that real stuff yeah. and it just, it just makes your heart even more open to what the person is willing to give to you. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. And I think that you know, finding a mentor doesn't always happen overnight either. No. Like mm -mm. Holly, you didn't have Sandy until later. I mean, not later oh, in yeah. your life. I'm not going to say like you're, <laughs> you're not that old, but I mean, you know, so I think I just want to yeah. encourage you if you're listening and you're saying, I don't have this person. Yep. How do I find this person? I'm going to put the link to the episode I did with uh, Lisa Pulliam in the show notes because she talked about mentorship as well. And she gave some really good practical tips on mm -hmm. finding mentors, on incorporating mentoring in your life. And it's a lot of what we've talked about, just that it's part of real life. Like it doesn't have to be a super formalized sit down for an hour every week and have a rigid agenda of what you're going to talk about. Yeah. So I would love for you to, to check that episode out if you haven't listened to that one. Yeah. So, okay. So we're going to wrap up here and Sandy, what we always wrap up with is talking about the fact that leaders are learners. And I love to hear from our guest what you're learning lately, what God has been teaching you lately. And if there's any sp specific recommendation of a book or a podcast or anything else that you would recommend to our listeners to check out. Mm. Well, most of what I've been reading lately is in preparation for the retreat that we have coming up. Um, and one of the books that I have found really fascinating is called Shrink by Tim Suttle. And the subtitle of it is Faithful Ministry in a Church Growth Culture. And I know for me personally that I have, um, I have just been feeling more and more comfortable with the whole idea of success in a church being measured by the size of the church. Um, or the popularity of its pastor. And I think that, um, you know, it's, we're seeing it in, in the church right now that, that how tenuous that position of being a celebrity pastor is and how mm. destructive it can be when there is a fall. Anyway, the point of this book is that it's not the, it's not the size of the church, big or small, but it's the faithfulness and the vulnerability and the integrity of the church leaders and of the congregation as well that mark a successful church. Mm. And, um, yeah. You know, we hear a lot that good is the enemy of great. You know, that's kind of the big catchphrase in leadership circles right now. But he makes the point that sometimes greatness is actually the enemy of goodness. Mm. And um, so I, I'm really, I'm loving this book. There's some parts of it that I don't 100% agree with, but he, he has a lot of really good valid points. Okay, great. We'll get that link so that we can put that in the show notes as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So as we wrap up, is there anything else that either one of you want to share just about anything we've talked about? I don't want to leave anything out. <laughs> I want to share that um, I feel like a super proud mama right now <laughs> in that both you and Esther, uh, you Holly and you Esther are um, your girls who I've had the privilege of pouring into. And I'm just so proud of 
this leadership podcast that you are doing. I'm so proud of your energy and your spunk and your just, you guys make things happen and I'm super proud. Thank you, Sandy. (laughs) Sandy has been one of our biggest cheerleaders in this adventure. So we so appreciate you coming on the podcast and being here with us. Is there a way that people can connect with you, a website or social media or anywhere that you would connect with people if they wanted to just learn more about you? Um, I have a website. It's sandyflu.com. And um, you can find out a little bit more about me and about what I do. If you need a speaker for your women's retreat, I have a lot of material that's already prepared and ready for you. So we uh, would have very little that you would need to do as far as the programming goes. Um, yeah. So yeah, sandyflu.com. Okay. And we'll make sure that's in the, the show notes as well. So thanks so much, Sandy and Holly, for uh, yeah. our conversation about women's ministry. I know it's going to encourage a lot of women and hopefully help uh, help any women's ministries that are trying to grow and continue to reach women in, in their churches. Thanks for joining us on the Christian Woman Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed this conversation, come and join us in our private Facebook community. We would love to get to know you better so that we can make sure the podcast is providing what you need. Plus, you can share your questions and ideas, and you'll be surrounded by incredible Christian women leaders. To join the group, visit estherlittlefield.com slash group. Now, don't forget, your leadership matters. And it's time for you to embrace your gifts and lead with confidence.